Hello, and welcome to Lecture 2 of the Work Unit in Phys 1104. We've seen before that our choice of system is in some sense arbitrary. We always have to get the same answers, no matter what choice of system we make. But, as we'll see in this lecture, there are times when doing our energy accounting when certain choices of system are much better than other choices. In the last lecture, we saw these two different system choices for this situation of a brick compressing a spring. And in particular, one of them is a closed system, whereas the other is not closed. And so the energy bar chart for the first choice looks like this, where we see that the system is converting gravitational potential energy into spring potential energy, whereas in the non-closed case, the system is gaining energy because work is being done on it by an outside force, and all of that gained energy ends up as spring potential energy. So far, so good, but think about what we actually use energy bar charts to do. Ultimately, an energy bar chart is a pictorial representation of our equation of conservation of energy for the system. Now, I usually avoid writing equations in the first one or two lectures of a unit, because I want those lectures to be focused on the ideas, not the math. But the whole point of an energy bar chart is that it represents an equation. So here's the equation that this one is representing. It's saying that the initial energies add up to the same quantity as the final energies. And in particular, the bar chart is showing us that one of those energies is zero. And so we can simplify it right away, and we have an equation which is very useful if we want to solve for something. On the other hand, in the non-closed situation, we don't end up with an equation. We end up with an inequality, or you could say it's telling us that the spring potential energy is initially zero and later it's not zero. But if we want to solve for something, that is certainly less useful. The problem is that at the moment, in our non-closed system, the energy bar chart is missing a crucial piece. It's missing the work. The work is the change in the system energy, and so if we include that, we should be able to make the two sides of the bar chart balance. So remember that the final system energy will either be bigger or smaller than the initial system energy, and it'll be bigger or smaller by an amount equal to the work done. So doing that, we'll end up conceptually with an energy bar chart that looks like this where the initial energy and the work add up to the final energy. Notice that the work ends up on the side of the bar chart, or in other words, on the side of the equation, with the initial energy. Don't let that make you think that the work is part of the initial energy. It isn't. It's just that to make the equation balance, we need it on that side of the equation. Let's see an example of that. So here we have two carts connected with a spring, and the rear cart is being pushed. And our system is the two carts and the spring. The person pushing is exerting an external force on the system, since the person isn't in the system. And the point of application of that force is moving, and so the person does work on the system. But that work is going to do two things. It's going to speed the carts up, and it's going to compress the spring. So that's a bit of a complicated situation, but the energy bar chart is just going to look like this, where we see that the kinetic energy increases and the spring potential increases, and the amount by which they increase is the work done. Notice that I've separated the work out from the kinetic energy and the potential energy on the initial side, because although it's going on the same side of the chart, or equivalently on the same side of our conservation of energy equation, it's not part of the same thing conceptually. It's not part of the initial energy. It's the difference between the final energy and the initial energy. Another way to draw a chart that shows this same thing would be to draw a chart that sh just shows the changes in energy. And so now we see the change in the kinetic energy and the change in the spring potential energy add up to the work done by external forces. Let me now do an example that illustrates some of the issues that come up around choosing our system. So here is a pail that's being lowered by a rope and there's a rope break that's slowing it down. You might not 
know what I mean by a rope break. It's something like this, or like this, that rubs on the rope as the rope passes through it. And so the main point is that the rope break is eventually bringing the system to rest, and it's doing it by friction, and so thermal energy is produced at the break, and some of that thermal energy ends up in the rope. So now let me look at three different choices of system and how those lead to different conclusions about the system energy, although in the end everything has to agree. So I've noted a few things to start. I've drawn the free body diagram for the pail just to note that the only forces on it are a gravitational force and a force by the rope. And I've also set up my energy bar charts, and the pail is included in my system for all three choices. I know the pail is slowing down, and so I know that the change in kinetic energy is negative. Now, the first choice is to include the pail and the earth in my system. Note that the pail goes down. And so we know the gravitational potential energy is decreasing, and so the change in gravitational potential energy is negative. And that should be everything for the energy in my system. The only other possibility here is a thermal energy. We know that's in the brake and the rope, and those are excluded from the system. But now look at the work done, because we can see that the change in system energy must be negative. Let's make sure that that's what we come up with when we analyze it. The gravitational force is an internal force, and so all we have to worry about is this force that the rope exerts on the pail. That points up and is an external force, but the other thing to notice is that the force displacement points down. And so the external force and the force displacement point in opposite directions. And so as we expect, because the system energy is decreasing, the work ought to be negative, and everything is adding up correctly and making sense. Now let's look at what happens when I do all the same things, but this time the brake is included in the system. Well, the pail and the earth are still included in the system, and so the gravitational potential energy has to come out the same way. However, now both of the forces acting on the pail are internal to our system, and so they do no work. The support that is holding the brake must be exerting a force on the brake. However, the point of application of that force doesn't move, and so that force does no work, and so we don't have to worry about it. But now we've included the brake and the rope in the system, and so the thermal energy that collects in those is part of the system now, and so we can see that the system energy can be conserved because there is a positive change in thermal energy which should offset the loss in the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy. Finally, let's look at one more choice. This time we're including the pail and the brake in the system, but not the earth. The consequence of that is that the gravitational force is now an external force on the system. It acts down, and as before, the force displacement vector also acts down. And so that means that the work done on the system by gravity should be positive. Note that we can't talk about a change in gravitational potential energy because we haven't included the Earth in our system, but we're still accounting for the effects of gravity through the work that the gravitational force does on the system. Once again, the rope and the brake are included in the system, and so we have the thermal energy, and there's a positive change in thermal energy, and I'm going to draw it to make clear that the positive change in the thermal energy plus the negative change in the kinetic energy should add up to the positive work being done. So let me stress that this has come out looking differently, but 
If I knew things like the inertia of the pail and the height that it falls through before coming to rest and things like that, I would be able to solve for everything else. And my solution would come out the same no matter which of these choices of system I made. As we've just seen, you can include the Earth in your system or not. Either choice is valid. However, you should make the choice very deliberately and be very clear about what choice you've made, because it'll make a difference to how you carry out your analysis. Remember that any potential energy always depends on relative positions of the objects that are inside the system. And so that's why if the Earth is outside the system, then you can't even define a gravitational potential energy. On the other hand, work always refers to changes of the system energy resulting from external forces. That means if the Earth is inside your system, then the gravitational forces do no work because they're internal forces to your system. So you need to make a choice. Either the Earth is inside your system, in which case you account for effects of gravity by looking at the gravitational potential energy, or the Earth is outside your system, in which case you account for the effects of gravity by calculating the work done by gravitational forces. You can do either one of these. The important point is that you must never do both, because if you do that, you'll be double counting gravity. My preference is usually to put the Earth inside my system if I don't have a reason to do otherwise, and that's just because gravitational potential energies are very easy to write down and to work with. However, there are times, for example, when for some reason your y-axis doesn't point straight up, that you don't want to use gravitational potential energy. Then you'll need to account for gravity using work, and at that point it becomes important to realize that the point of application of the gravitational force can always be thought of as the center of mass of an object. Friction is a very complicated force. You're going to get much more of an impression for that in the next unit of the course. But here we see an example of friction making life difficult for us. Let's think of this situation of a person pulling a block at constant velocity towards themselves with a rope. And let's start by thinking about the system not including the surface, the ground under the block. Well, friction generates thermal energy at the boundary between the block and the ground. The problem is that if we haven't included the surface in the system, then we don't know how much of that energy has ended up in our system and how much of it has ended up in the ground, which is outside our system. And so our energy accounting becomes impossible. We know that the person must have expended some chemical energy, but there's an external friction force doing work, and the only way we can really know that is if we know the thermal energy in the system. Then we would be able to solve for it. But we have no idea how much thermal energy is in our system. The situation is much simpler if we include the surface in our system. Now there simply are no external forces doing any work. And so it's clear that all of the chemical energy expended by the person is going to end up as thermal energy in our system, and there's no external work. This is much simpler to deal with. You can just understand this difficulty by realizing that we don't know how much of the thermal energy has wound up in the system or outside of the system if we choose our system boundary to be along the surface where the friction is occurring. But there's another way to understand it. Let's compare it with pushing a cart. In this case, the force that the person is exerting on the cart has a well-defined point of application. And so it's easy to define a force displacement vector. In contrast, though, if you think about the kinetic friction that the ground is exerting on the block, that's distributed over the whole bottom of the block. Even worse, it may not be evenly distributed over the whole bottom of the block, and so it becomes very difficult to define a force displacement vector. So, as a result of all this, the advice I will give you is that you should never choose a system which would result in friction acting along the boundary of the system. That just makes your analysis difficult, so don't do it.